Hello, and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we take old creatures from past editions of D&D and convert them to 5th edition so you can use them in your current 5th edition D&D campaigns. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are talking about a classic creature that was heinously left out of the most recent Dungeons & Dragons book. The book in question, of course, being Fizban's Treasury of Dragons, and the creature in question being the Song Dragon. If you weren't into D&D monsters previous to 4th edition, there's a good chance you might not know what a Song Dragon is. You may, however, have heard the term thrown around on the internet, or you may have also heard them referred to as Were Dragons, because that's basically what they are. The defining feature of the Song Dragon is that it has two different forms and it can switch between them in much the same way that a lycanthrope might switch between being a werewolf and being a human. Except in the case of the Song Dragon, it is shifting between being a human and a dragon. A much more intimidating prospect. When Song Dragons are in their draconic form, they appear quite beautiful. They look almost like more silverescent copper dragons. They have this stark metallic sheen to them that's quite nice to look at and also indicates their high status amongst dragon kind. When they're in their humanoid form, they traditionally appear only as women, which is actually a really interesting detail. The way this creature is originally written, even the male members of the song dragon species still transform into a female form when they become human. What's also interesting is the humanoid form that they transform into is completely unique to that individual. This isn't a polymorph or kind of disguise self-like effect. In much the same way that a lycanthrope in humanoid form always looks the same, a song dragon in humanoid form also always looks the same. There's a lot of debate within the D&D canon about the origin of the song dragon and what their true nature actually is. However, it's most commonly believed that all song dragons share a common ancestor, and that ancestor was gifted this draconic form by some type of higher being, likely some type of powerful dragon. Why their humanoid form is always female is unknown. But it is a little bit of extra weirdness that kind of makes your players go, huh, why is that the way that it is? And maybe you come up with your own explanation as to why, or maybe you just ignore that altogether and you have it so that they can appear as anywhere along the gender spectrum that you like. Why these creatures were left out of Fizban's Treasury of Dragons, I have no idea. They're a fan favorite, and the only reason I had kind of held off on converting them as long as I have was because I just assumed that whenever wizards put out their big dragon book, we were gonna see song dragons, but I guess I was wrong. However, none of this is a problem because that's what I'm here for. So today we're gonna take a look at just exactly what the song dragon is, what it's capable of in combat, and what its stat block sort of looks like, and then we're gonna get into some more in-depth lore, plot hooks, story ideas, and different ways that you might employ a song dragon in your D&D campaign. As always, I have made a 5th edition stat block for this creature, which I converted based off of the 3.5 monster stat block, and there is a link to that in the description below, so if you want to follow along while we're talking about it, or you think this monster sounds cool and you might want to actually use it, I've done most of the heavy lifting for you to get it in your game. Now let's move along to the first segment of our video and talk about some... So when it comes to combat, as I have said with many of the other dragons I've covered in the past, their abilities are very similar to that of other dragons, so I'm not going to bore you with the minutia of claw and tail attacks. They have them, they work the same way as they always have with all the other dragons, they also have that frightful presence, all that stuff, you know how that works. They are scary and powerful as all dragons are and should be. What I'm going to really focus on in this segment of the video is what makes the song dragon different from other dragons in terms of its abilities and how it fights. For example, song dragons are actually quite a bit weaker than other true dragons of the same CR threshold. Their stats aren't quite as high as their other kin, but they don't trade this away with nothing in return. In exchange for giving up some of the raw power and hit points that many of the other dragons get, 
they retain some really interesting immunities. For example, they cannot be charmed or poisoned. Not being able to be charmed is a big one. And they're also immune to all non-magical sources of damage. In addition to that, they also have true sight out to 15 feet, which is a huge deal. It might feel like one of those things that's just kind of there for a bit of extra flavor, which it absolutely is, but being able to see invisible creatures or see through illusions is a massive advantage. The other thing that sets them apart is, of course, course, the alternate form ability, which allows them to shift between human and dragon and back again. That might not be the most useful thing in combat, but it could be really useful for trying to get away or blend in with a crowd. It also allows for the element of surprise in a profound way, because it's very difficult for an adult red dragon, for example, to sneak up on somebody they're trying to take out. An adult song dragon has the advantage of being able to sneak in as a human and then shift into a dragon, cause what Whatever mayhem need be caused and then shift back into their human form to escape. The other major difference we're going to see here is that they have a static gas breath weapon. This is one of the coolest breath weapons of any of the dragons that I've ever covered or seen in print. I think it's really really interesting. The song dragon has this sort of air of magic and in tuneness with magic attached to them and their breath weapon perfectly reflects that. See when they breathe this 40 foot cone of static gas each creature within it has to make the dexterity saving throw and if they fail they take the full lightning damage and if they pass it then they take half as much lightning damage but regardless it does some lightning damage however what's really unique about this breath weapon is the gas that they exhale lingers and after the initial lightning damage is caused it turns the zone where the gas was breathed into an anti-magic field so that entire 40 foot cone does not allow magic to exist within it. It also acts as a zone of silence, meaning no sound can pass through that area. Depending on how you set up the combat and who the dragon is fighting against, if there are spellcasters involved or not, and what the terrain looks like, this ability can be used in a lot of interesting ways. Being able to spew out anti-magic and silence zones around the battle map can be a huge advantage. And anytime a creature has an ability that allows you to interact on that level with the terrain, I just always think it's really fun and interesting. Another thing you won't necessarily see on my stat block as a default option, but I do want to talk about is adding spells to this creature. If we reference Fizban's Treasury of Dragons, there's a section about how very old dragons often have access to spells and abilities. These spells and magical abilities are not reflected on the default dragon stat block because it can make a dragon very powerful to give like an apex predator additional magical spells they can cast. But in the case of the song dragon, I highly encourage you to do it. Anyone who played older versions of D&D will know exactly what I'm talking about here, but Dragons used to always have access to certain spells once they pass certain age thresholds. The whole idea being that a creature that in tune with magic and that old would definitely learn to pick up some magic along the way. Song dragons are sort of savants when it comes to understanding magic and they get access to some really powerful and awesome spells in third edition. What I would encourage you to do if you're gonna use a song dragon in your game is think about what spells that specific song dragon might know and consider making them available to the creature. You don't need to do this because it will make the song dragon much more difficult to fight if it's an enemy or much more powerful if it's on the side of the party, but it's something worth considering. But regardless of whether you're choosing to add spells to your specific song dragon or not, I think by this point we should all have a pretty good idea of what they're capable of in combat and how they're going to fight. So with that said, let's move along and talk about some. When it comes to actually using a song dragon in your campaign, there are a myriad of different ways you can employ this creature because it's just a very diverse monster. Song dragons are neutral in nature, which means that they can kind of fall on the morality spectrum anywhere you want to throw them. You can use them as a horrendous villain. You can use them as an extremely helpful and good ally. You can use them as a sort of indifferent personality who's in it for themselves but aligned with the party for one reason or another, or vice versa, someone who's kind of indifferent to the whole 
grand scene, but is aligning themselves with the bad guys for one reason or another that involves personal gain. Making any NPC in your game a song dragon is definitely a decision that I wouldn't make too lightly, but is certainly one that could bring that NPC to the next level in terms of what they've got going on personality-wise. Something really interesting about song dragons is they very rarely actually take their draconic form on. They are more than happy to live out their entire lives under the guise of being a human without ever really cracking that shell and pulling back the veil to reveal that they are actually a draconic creature. A song dragon will reveal its true form to maybe a handful of people throughout its entire life, and anytime it does so, it's either out of an immense trust with that other individual, or because some type of force has put it in danger and it has to turn into a dragon to defend itself. As far as plots go that specifically involve the song dragon, I would think about what makes it necessary for a song dragon to be part of the story you're trying to tell. Like, what is it you want to do in a story that you can't do with a regular dragon or with a human? For example, perhaps you throw a plot at your players where there's a dragon hunt happening. A dragon's been spotted near the fringe of town, and the players are kind of tasked with helping find this dragon and take it out before it becomes a threat. In reality, the dragon being seen is a song dragon, and it's actually someone from within the city. So why are they taking their dragon form in a place that might be visible to prying eyes? The answer to that is where your adventure lies, right? Because who knows why they're doing that? Maybe they're doing it knowing that the sighting of a dragon will drive down real estate value in the area so they can buy it up, gentrify it, and make it into a more ritzy part of town using their mass of wealth that they've attained over a long lifetime. Maybe the song dragon is going out every few nights to defend the town from something that's even more threatening that the people just aren't aware of. Or maybe this particular song dragon just likes to stretch its wings from time to time and take a flight throughout the canyon. Whatever the case is, Coming up with the reason why a song dragon might be revealing itself temporarily, even if unintentionally, is going to help you figure out just exactly what your plot there is. Another really cool thing you could do with a song dragon as an NPC that may not ever see combat is incorporating them as part of a character's backstory. If you have a draconic blood sorcerer playing in your game, or maybe you're playing a draconic blood sorcerer in an upcoming D&D game, Having part of the reason for that draconic sorcery within them be because there's a song dragon somewhere in their ancestry would be really interesting. Perhaps as that character discovers more about their past and more about where their powers come from, they realize that a parent or a grandparent or even a great grandparent who's still alive and looking kinda young is actually a song dragon and thus the source of their power. Being a half song dragon, especially an unknown one, could make for a really interesting draconic bloodline backstory. So I guess that leaves only one big glaring question, which is why are they called song dragons? The reason for this is more of a cultural inclination than anything else, because there's nothing innate about the song dragon that makes it musical or song-like per se. Song dragons simply just have a bend towards the musical. They like to sing and they like to play musical instruments and make music in whatever form that looks like in the culture in which they exist. They often sing as they go into battle. They sing while they do their chores in the morning. They sing as they walk down to market. They just like music. They like singing and that's why they're called song dragons. I kid you not. But keeping that in mind, that could be a really interesting detail to throw towards your party. Maybe to tip them off that some NPC actually is a song dragon. Part of that NPC's personality might be that they really love picking away at their guitar while they're talking to people, or maybe they're always singing idly when they're not really paying attention. And through some third party learning about song dragons and the existence thereof, maybe the party's able to connect the dots about, hey, we know someone who's singing all the time, wouldn't it be funny if they were a song dragon? Haha, <laughs> oh, they actually are, weird. But regardless of all that, I think song dragons are really interesting, and I think they provide us with a really cool curveball we can kind of attach to an NPC in our D&D games to throw your players for a bit of a loop.
If you like this video and you like listening to me talk about monsters and you like discovering new old monsters that are now new again and seeing the converted stat blocks for those guys, definitely be sure to subscribe, leave a like, leave a comment and tell me what monsters you'd like to see show up on the channel eventually. Most of the monsters that we cover on this show are recommended by audience members, so I couldn't do it without y'all. And I want to give a special shout out to all the lovely patrons over on Patreon. If you are one of my fantastic patrons, you of course get the 5th edition style monster manual stat block with the extra lore and the artwork and all the fancy stuff. So you can stick that in your DM folder, whip it out, and all your players will go, wow, that's cool. And then you get to go, yeah, I know. But sincerely, thank you all very much just for watching. And thank you guys so much for sharing these videos and stuff. I see these videos pop up from time to time on Reddit just when people are talking about D&D &D monsters. And it always brings a little warmth to my cold, dead heart to see my creatures scattering out into the wilderness. But that's all we've got for the song, Dragon. So until next time, I will see you then.